Hello, I'm Professor Patrick McGorry. Welcome to today's webinar. Before we proceed, as Executive Director of Origin, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we work around Australia and pay my respects to Elders both past and present. Hi everyone, my name is Helen Nicholl. I'm a clinical educator here at Origin, the National Centre of Excellence in Youth Mental Health. I'm really excited to be able to introduce to you Dr. David Collins. He is a clinical psychologist and director of Brain Grow, which is a student wellbeing program. Um, he has lots of experience in delivering talks across Australia. And I first heard about Dave when a friend of mine had told me about um, a gentleman that had come in to talk to grade nine boys about gaming and te technology and technology use. So I'm really excited about what he has to say today. So thank you everyone and let's go. Hi, it's great to be here today. I'm here to talk about the developing brain in a digital world, and the impacts of social media, gaming and other technologies. Uh, first of all, what a privilege it is to be here at Origin and, uh, and talking to or for such a wonderful organisation that does such great work. Uh, I do a lot of these talks uh, in schools and uh, all over the country, but to do one here for Origin uh, is a great thing and, um, and hopefully we can get a lot, of, um, a lot of people watching this particular webinar. Um, so let's move forward. Let's think a little bit about the developing brain as a starting point and let's start with some learning outcomes. Uh, there's four key learning outcomes that we're looking for today. The first one is to understand some of the literature uh, on technology use in young people. And the second one is to understand basically how the brain learns and that's quite a complex process and to get through that in about 45 minutes uh, is a tall ask so we'll see how well we can go with that. Uh, understanding how technology can impact on the way brains learn both in healthy ways and less healthy ways and some practical takeaway strategies to use with young people, you know, whether you're a clinician or a parent or a teacher, whoever you might be who's watching this. Let's start with a very basic principle of neuroscience, which is experiences change the brain. It's the basic maxim of neuroscience, and we know that every experience we have will change our ways, either in significant ways or more subtle ways. We've got about 86 billion brain cells or neurons, and we know that these neurons share a very, very special relationship with each other. There's a lot of uh, different types of principles in neuroscience, and one of the key principles is that cells that fire together, wire together. So every time we have an experience, a whole range of networks in our brain start to light up. And if two cells fire together, or two or more cells fire together consistently enough, they form very powerful networks in our brain. And that's what we know about the brain. The brain is a network. And thus experiences change the brain. Um, one of the fundamental principles here is neuroplasticity, uh, which is a concept that many people might be familiar with. And um, we'll talk about that quite a bit as we go along today. Let's think about these concepts of experiences though. There was a recent study a couple of years ago um, by Eden TV, uh, which is a TV channel in the UK. And they looked at a survey of 2,000 British children aged between one and 12. I found some really, really interesting results. What they found is that 64% of children that they surveyed played outside less than once per week. Uh, and that wasn't including playing outside at school. This was more in their recreational activity outside of school. They found that 28% of children had never been on a walk in the countryside. 21% had never been to a farm. This is a really interesting one that I found. 20% of children had never climbed a tree. If we think about this, I think there's various different reasons why this might happen, various different factors. And again, we'll talk about them as we go. Um, one of the big ones that gets a lot of media attention is parental overprotection. Uh, and the idea that we, we try to cotton wool our kids or bubble wrap our kids. And I think that can be part of it. Uh, another part of it uh, that we often see uh, is overscheduling. Uh, and this is true of kids, but it's also true of adolescents as well. Uh, running around um, you know, during the week and then on weekends with various different activities. And while these activities are really, really important, we also need to schedule time for downtime. And we know the brain needs lots of downtime in order to grow, heal itself, uh, and continue to develop. Um, let's think 
about a question for the audience here. I want you to think about what your most salient or your most prominent childhood memory is. Just sit there and wait a little bit and think about it. Okay. For me, one of my most salient childhood memories is climbing trees. And, you know, that research study we just talked about before, or the survey we just talked about before, was pretty relevant for me. And I'm sure a lot of the audience spent a lot of their time, or at least some of their time, climbing trees. My best friend had a beautiful tree in his front yard, and we used to spend a lot of the weekends up the top of that tree playing games, pretending we're in spaceships and helicopters and all these kind of wonderful things. Now, it's interesting because those memories come to me even still to this day. So there's a tree not far from my house around uh, in a park, um, not far from my house. And it's a very similar tree. It might be the same tree, I'm not sure. Um, my skills in botany probably aren't quite there. Um, but every time I walk past that tree, particularly at a certain type of year, time of year, uh, in the springtime, the smell of that tree reminds me of the tree in front of my best friend's house. Um, and what's interesting, interesting about that is it transports me back to when I was 10 years old at the top of that tree. The question becomes, what happens if I never climb the tree? What happens if I didn't have those experiences? Well, as I walk past that tree in the park down uh, near my house now, well to my adulthood, that memory would never be triggered. Now this tells us something really, really, really important about the very nature of memory. We think about explicit memory, which is memory of facts and figures, and these are the things that um, in a school education system, for example, will teach to numeracy and literacy and these kind of things. But what we actually know about the brain is that most learning in the brain is what we call implicit learning. It's memories about how we feel in certain situations. And these implicit memories are the things that are triggered when I walk past that tree but they were the things that were formed very much in my early life. And we talked about me being 10 years old, but that's very true of people um, who were in their teenage years and even in their early 20s. And it's a really, really important point because it gets back to that basic principle we talked about, that experiences change the brain. Without those experiences, your brain cannot change in a significant way. Uh, and we know that that period of adolescence and in our early 20s is a hugely neuroplastic period, a neuroplastic window for young people uh, and their brain is changing immensely uh, and therefore the experiences and the quality and variety of experiences that we have not only shapes our brain now but shapes our brain into the future through those implicit memory systems we were talking about. And effectively another way you can think about implicit memories is that the basic fundamental assumptions or beliefs that we hold about the world. I'm safe, I'm well, I'm loved, I'm cared for. Um, and if you think about it from that tree perspective, the world is a place full of interesting things to explore. Uh, and that was certainly my experience and I'm sure many of your experiences too. But let's think a little bit about how technology can both promote that, but also challenge that. So if much of the brain operates, uh, if much of the way the brain operates is not explicitly conscious, but it's more influenced by our implicit memory systems. And as I walk past that tree, I'm not thinking about me as a 10 year old, but those memories still get triggered by those sensory experiences of being in the tree as a 10 year old. Those sensory experiences are very much uh, embedded into my neural networks, if you like. If we don't have those experiences, what does that mean for our sense of self? our sense of identity and who we are. Uh, and one of the issues with technology, and we'll talk about why um, the sky is not falling when it comes to technology use, uh, and technology is neither good or bad, um, uh, but it all depends on context, and we'll talk about that a little bit as we go. Uh, but if too much of our experiences in is in front of a screen, or too many of our experiences are in front of a screen, what does that mean for our developing sense of self? What does that mean for our experiences? And can we get that wide range of sensory and interpersonal and human experiences that we need in order to develop that true sense of self and a healthy brain moving forward? Let's ask a question, well, what kind of experiences? I show this picture um, at quite a few of my talks that I do uh, in schools and um, to parents, and uh, this picture always, uh, and, and to teachers um, and um, 
to many other types of people. Uh, and this picture always brings uh, some interesting questions. Uh, this is effectively the iPad potty. Um, and it's available for under $100, I think you can buy this for. Um, and for me, this picture, I'm not saying the technology again is either good or bad. I'm not passing judgment on this particular piece of uh, equipment. But it does highlight a point that technology is creeping into every part of our life now. And again, that can be healthy and unhealthy, uh, depending on the context. But the question becomes, does, and that little child I think is probably under two years of age, does that child need an iPad while they are on the potty? Um, and while the subjects or the, the, the young people that we're talking about now certainly aren't doing that. Um, you know, we need to ask some questions about when they're using their technology uh, and is that a good context uh, for them to find themselves in. Let's think about one particular brain network. So one of the things that uh, is often mistaken about the brain is thinking about the brain in individual parts. So we've got lots of different brain areas, our amygdala, which is the home of our fear response or our prefrontal cortex, which is otherwise known as our smart brain, where we do a lot of our logical thinking and language comes from there, particularly our left prefrontal cortex. But it would be a mistake to think of our brain as a, a series of separate parts. What we know is our brain is actually an interconnected network. And it's the experiences that we have that connect those networks together. Those 86 billion brain cells connect all those networks together, forming what we call an integrated brain. And an integrated brain is a healthy brain, a brain that's resilient and, and more um, tolerant to things like mental health issues. The default mode network is an interesting part of the brain uh, and it spans a whole range of different areas and connects a whole range of different areas and it's a part of the brain that's active when we're not focused on an external task. So more when we're inwardly focused thinking about our thoughts and our experiences. There's two other, well, there's actually lots of brain networks, but there's two other brain networks uh, relevant to this, which is the executive network. So hopefully right now your executive network is activated uh, and that executive network basically helps you pay attention and it's partly uh, involved in our prefrontal cortex. So pay, if a uh, young person's in class focusing on the teacher, their uh, executive network is activated and listening and being able to integrate the information. And the salience network, uh, and that has the job of switching between the networks and helping depend or helping decide um, which we should do, what we should be paying attention to. Should we pay, be paying attention to something internal or something external? Now, if we think about the default mode network, uh, I might just change slides. If we think about the default mode network, it's hugely important in our autobiographical memories, uh, which is another form of implicit memory. Um, so these autobiographical memories are memories about who we are, uh, the experiences that we have, and they integrate our value system and a whole range of other things. So the way I think about the default mode network, it's like a needle and thread to our experiences and our memories. It threads them together to form a coherent life narrative. And the picture here it tells a thousand stories. Each experience is one of the Polaroids uh, and the default mode network adds them together or stitches them together to form a coherent sense of who we are. Now it doesn't do that independently. There's lots of other brain networks that are involved in that, um, but that's one of its key jobs. Now, just reiterating the point, the default mode network is active when we're inwardly focused. When we're outwardly focused, it tends to go quiet. So if we're on a screen all the time, if we're continually externally focused, that default mode network doesn't have as much opportunity to become active. And what does that mean then for our ability to stitch together our experiences? Um, and I could probably talk about that one for the next hour, um, but I might move on and talk about a specific uh, example. Um, on my way to my um, clinic uh, each day, I drive past lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of different schools um, in my area. Uh, and one of the common things I'll see as I'm driving is that mum or dad will be driving, or whoever it might be, older brother or sister, they'll be driving and the young person, you know, typically a teenager, will be in the passenger seat. And very often that teenager is completely engrossed in their smartphone. Now, it's an interesting one because when we think about it, there's so many different sensory experiences that could be happening as you go to school. So many things that you could be looking at, whether it's the person riding on a bike next to you or an interesting person walking the other way. All these sensory experiences are really, really important. 
But if you're buried in your phone, you miss out on those things. Now again, it's all about context and it's all about time. You know, if that's the only time you're on the phone for the day, fine, and you, you're integrated in other ways, not a problem. But if that's a representation of how your relationship typically is, then I think it's something that we could uh, we could certainly look at because that valuable time you might travel for half an hour to school, uh, you might travel for five minutes. It's true. It's the same with kids who catch the bus to school, or the train to school, or whatever it might be. Uh, and obviously, there's some social networking that happens as well during those times. And again, it's all about context. But let's say hypothetically that you are driving to school with your family together. That's a great opportunity to talk and connect. And we know that the number one predictor of well-being is social connection uh, and human relationships. Um, so one thing to think about is, well, do we need the iPhone or the smartphone or whatever it might be as we're driving to school, or can we keep it in the bag? Um, and it's something that's individual for every family. Um, as we've established, and if you take anything away from this talk, what I hope you take away is the brain needs experiences to grow. Um, and since the 1970s, the radius of acti or the radius of space that children are free to want or freely wanted to play has shrunk by 90%. So we're left with about 10%. It sounds a bit like habitat destruction. We're left to about with about 10% uh, of space left that children play. Now there's a whole range of reasons for this. Um, I think it's there's lifestyle factors, there's social pressures, there's a whole range of things. There's um, you know, potentially overprotection, but that's quite a controversial one. Um, although the research on um, you know, how dangerous the world is, um, I might not talk about that so much today, but there's some interesting research on whether or not the world really is any more dangerous than it was four years ago. Um, but what happens if kids and teenagers and young people don't have those experiences? Um, and there's an interesting paradox that happens here. While we've got this shrinking space, uh, physical space, which kids grow and the experiences they have, we have this rapid dissemination of technology. So there's this kind of paradoxical effect. The space in which we play and experience the world is shrinking, but the amount of technology is growing hugely. So if you think about something like called uh, penetration rate, which is a, a term, and I think there's different ways to, to um, define this, but uh, markers would look at it as in um, the, how long it takes for somebody or a product to reach 50 million users. It took the radio 38 years. It took the telephone 20 years, that kind of makes sense. Television, 13 years. Mobile phones, 12 years, it was a bit of a slow uptake. I don't know if, I'm sure people remember those old brick phones uh, that used to carry around like a suitcase. Or, uh, moved a long way since then. Uh, the internet, four years, and I'm hearing the dial-up uh, internet uh, in my ear as I speak. Uh, Facebook, two years. YouTube, um, one year. It took Angry Birds 35 days to reach 50 million viewers, or 50 million users. And we just think about the power of technology, and that's nothing against Angry Birds or, or any of these types of technologies, but we can see how rapidly we pick them up because these technologies are so beautifully designed to impact on the very things that our brain loves. Things like social connection and things like novelty, new stuff. And we'll talk about why novelty is a really, really, really important uh, need for our brain and how most technologies are very, very effective at linking in and um, um, drawing into that. Um, I'm sure there's lots of Angry Bird uh, lovers watching this as well. But here's the thing. The sky, when it comes to technology use, is absolutely not falling. I think there's a lot of panic uh, amongst lots of people, and probably particularly adults, uh, about the problems with technology use. And it's absolutely the case that it can be problematic, and we'll talk about some of those reasons as we go. But ultimately, like anything in science, the devil is in the detail. Um, and if we just look at technology as a broad chunk of a thing, then of course we're going to look at it as a problem. But again, you know, we need to take our skeptical glasses here, like a good scientist, uh, and look at the variables that might promote healthy technology use and the variables that might make technology use not such a healthy thing. Um, and it's a pretty important concept to make sure that we're not having this panic uh, about what actually technology is doing to our brain, because 
when you look at the research, it's an ambivalent literature. Um, there's a lot of literature that will say that well, certain types of technologies used in certain ways will be problematic, and there's also literature that says certain types of technologies used in certain ways can actually be really helpful for us. Um, and overall, technology, no doubt, has had hugely important impacts uh, on the way we live our lives, and often in a very positive way. And speaking of that, um, this is one, whenever I'm treating a young person uh, who's got some issues around video game use, and this talk is not about uh, internet gaming addiction, it's not a clinical talk looking at the concept of addiction, which in and of itself is a somewhat controversial idea, um, and you know, we know the DSM uh, did highlight that as an area of further research um, and you know there's probably a whole nother you know, five hours of discussion on that particular problem uh, and a lot of the steam research is working on that um, you know, as we speak uh, but we know that so um, getting back to that point I'll often start with the, the kids I see who are using um, screen time too much I'll often start with this point which is video games can actually be really good um, for our brain um, and there was a little bit of research that came out recently looking at the idea that um, video gamers theoretically could make better surgeons as well because of the hand-eye coordination um, that they develop as a result of gaming. Um, so there's certainly an increase in hand-eye coordination that can happen as a result of video gaming, um, which, is, which is a great thing. Um, but it also highlights the point that anything you repeat often enough, uh, you'll get better at. And that's the basic point of the brain. Um, that if you repeat something often enough, you repeat an experience often enough, the networks that carry that experience will become better established. They'll become effectively default networks in our brain. Uh, and as we go, we'll talk a little bit about myelination uh, and how uh, the brain learns in that way. But the question is of uh, generalizability. Um, so how well do those skills that you learn on the games generalize to the world outside of those video games? Uh, and the jury is still very much out on that, as it is on brain training games or brain training programs. And again, um, this is not a commentary on whether they're good or bad, uh, but more again, the devil's in the detail. Um, and really the key question here, and essentially this is a point of our whole talk here, it's not so much, or it's not just about what you're doing when you're on video games or on screen time, you're on Instagram, Facebook, on YouTube, whatever it might be, it's not so much about what you're doing when you're on there or how long you're on there, although that is an important point. The question becomes, what are you not doing when you're on screen time? Um, what are you not doing? Are you not physically exercising? Are you not sleeping? Are you not socially connecting? Uh, and there's some pretty significant impacts on, um, uh, on all those things if you use screen time too much. A word of warning, uh, or a, a word of caution more than warning. Uh, anytime you talk about the brain, or anytime you hear anybody talk about the brain, uh, I'd like everybody to put their skeptical goggles on. Um, there's a lot of uh, big headlines like smartphones are destroying our brains. These are kind of, you'll see these in mainstream media. Teenagers are becoming antisocial. Teenagers are addicted to screen time. Uh, we're raising a generation of screen addicts. I'm far from convinced that that's the case. Um, I certainly think that's a possibility, not certainly a generation or um, you know, every teenager, uh, but some young people are certainly uh, at risk. Uh, but my experience with teenagers and young people in general is that they are not an antisocial group in any way, shape or form. And just like all of us, they have a deep need to connect. It's just that they connect in different ways to us. Uh, we were born in an area or a world where there wasn't social media. Uh, and they were born into a world where there was. And social media becomes a hugely important way in which they connect um, with their friends and their peers. Um, but there are some key variables that would determine whether or not social media is healthy or unhealthy. So we always need to be putting ourselves in the shoes of the people that we work with, um, or the people, you know, our own kids, or um, if you're a teacher, um, the students in your class. And um, social media um, is and probably will for a long time be a huge part of young people social world um, yeah and just a, a comment on that idea of um, you know being careful when anyone talks about brain science uh, we know we can take very complex findings um, that neuroscientists find in the lab and make very broad generalizations about them which may not actually be true to the findings themselves and uh, Molly Crockett does a lovely TED talk called Neurobunk uh, to demonstrate this idea that we always need to be careful about taking those scientific findings and making kind of broad and general uh, conclusions when usually those findings are very specific. 
Um, but there was an interesting little social study done in 2011. Um, this was 1,000 secondary school students from 12 different countries. Uh, and they went for 24 hours without any technology use at all. No internet, phone, gaming, social media. And the um, uh, Moller who did this research, uh, or this um, social experiment, if you like, um, she kind of expected people to lapse. So she said, even if you lapse, don't give up, keep going. And even if you quickly check Instagram or whatever it might be, keep going. Here's what they found. This was some of the feedback that they got from the participants in this little experiment. I began going crazy. I felt paralyzed, almost handicapped in my ability to live. I felt dead. I felt as though I was being tortured. I sat in my bed and stared blankly. I had nothing to do. And one uh, really interesting piece of feedback was I sat in my bed and stared blankly. I had nothing to do, sorry, I've written that twice there. Um, and it's interesting because again, it's that idea, well, if I don't have this device in front of me, what do I do? And I think it gets back to the idea we need to start young. Young people get used to being, that being the only technology that they have or the only way to entertain themselves. Then that becomes the default way that they entertain themselves. And there's an interesting study that was done that kind of demonstrates a somewhat troubling point. And this is by Wilson in 2014. There's a, a series of 11 experiments, which I won't all summarize here. But uh, effectively, what they did is they left people in a room. These were young people. They left them in the room uh, for between 6 and 14 minutes. And they were asked a very specific question, which was, I want you to only focus on your thoughts. Nothing else, just your thoughts. There was nothing in the room to distract them at all. There wasn't even a pen on the table. Um, there's certainly no phones. Just a plain blank room. And they were asked, they were actually given a little, a tiny little electric shock machine. Um, and on this electric shock machine, it, was a, it could give a small, but uh, very, very, um, not a particularly painful, but a small little shock. Um, and what was interesting is that around 67% of the subjects in that particular study chose the electric shock over sitting there bored with their own thoughts. Um, and that, that's an interesting one. Whenever I do a talk, I'll ask people this question, what would you do? And it's amazing how many people put their hand up and say, I would actually give the electric shock machine a go. Uh, and there's a good reason for that. And what Wilson talked about was this idea of the scanner hypothesis. So the idea here is that from an evolutionary perspective, focusing too much on your external, or sorry, your internal experiences is not evolutionary adaptive. Um, because you need to be scanning for threats and dangers. You know, back in our, uh, our ancestors many, 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 many years ago, if they were sitting there focusing too much or meditating or whatever it might be, then there could be a hungry bear prowling around. Um, so thus our brain has developed this tendency and this preference in many ways to focus more on external experiences because historically those external experiences have been more um, relevant to our survival. Uh, and without that, we wouldn't be here as a species, of course. Um, so focusing on environmental information is environmentally adaptive. But if you think about where that you know, that little program in our brain developed, it was a time when there wasn't that much environmental information to be scanning for. Um, you know, there was things in the forest or there was you know, potentially an occasional bear or new streams of water or, you know, climbing a mountain or, you know, certain people who lived in our family or maybe even our smaller community were kind of moving around a little bit way, way, way back in, uh, in our ancestors' days. But if you think about the volume of technology used now, the uh, volume of information now, it's significantly more, yet we still have this deep need to scan for information. And this is where we get to a chemical, um, a very well-known chemical, one of the most famous chemicals and misunderstood chemicals in our brain, uh, dopamine. Um, and again, this is something I could probably talk for a long time about, but I'll, I might skim um, the, the, the super technical parts of it. Um, now dopamine's a, a quite a misunderstood chemical. So it's often associated with pleasure and reward, as it should be, because that's really, really important. But it's also the basis or part of the basis for movement, for motor movement and coordination. Uh, we think about something like Parkinson's. Uh, we know there's uh, disruptions in the dopaminergic system there where people can't have smooth movement uh, in their body. Um, so dopamine is both about reward but it's also about physical movement. So in a lot of ways, it's about moving towards that reward. It's not just the feel-good factor, but it helps us actually be motivated to move our bodies towards whatever that reward might be. 
So if we think about dopamine as it relates to something like Fortnite, uh, just doing a quick bit of research, in 2018, Fortnite, which I'm sure a lot of uh, the viewers will be familiar with, made about $2.4 billion uh, in just a 12-month period. Uh, it's just an extraordinary number. And if you look at video games, the production value of these video games are extraordinary. Uh, if you look at something like Grand Theft Auto, uh, which is a hugely popular video game, uh, the cost of developing that game uh, is in the tens to hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, and it takes years and years of very, very skilled people developing these games. What these games are particularly good at is linking in with our dopamine systems. So if you eat a piece of chocolate, what do you want to do? You want to eat another piece of chocolate. So dopamine has that motto, if you like, well, that feels good, let's do that behavior again. So we do that behavior again, and ultimately, in a very simple way, that's the basis of motivation. We want to repeat that behavior again, so we're motivated to do it. But we can think about dopamine in two ways. We can have it in terms of the needing or the, the liking system, or the wanting system. So if you eat that piece of chocolate, it feels good, the dopamine receptors will fire off and you'll wanna eat that chocolate again. But that's actually not the most powerful part of that system. It's the wanting part that's the most powerful part of that dopamine system when it comes to motivation. So if you're in the supermarket uh, looking at the chocolate, your dopamine systems will generally fire off much more strongly than what they will once you've eaten the chocolate. So it's actually the wanting bit that makes more, uh, that has a bigger impact on our motivation than the liking bit. And if you think about that in terms of gaming, um, these, the gaming um, industry is really, really great at promoting that. So if you think about something like Fortnite, and it's got millions and millions of users uh, all the way around the world, they're really good at releasing new additions or new apps or new skins on the gun, which are like the colors that they, um, uh, that they can have on the guns or uh, suits that you can wear um, or different outs, outfits and all the rest of it. And a lot of my clients will sit there and just be absolutely in complete anticipation of the next Thursday because they're releasing a new thing. What's actually happening there is we're getting the reward systems upregulated. Those dopamine systems are getting upregulated. And what does that do? It has a massive impact on what they want to do with their behavior. They want to be there online ready to go and get that new skin or get that new gun or whatever that might actually be. Now, there's nothing wrong with that in any way, shape or form. But if that becomes the basis of life, then we miss out on all those other experiences. And one of the tricks here is, and this is uh, the old classic term anhedonia, which I'm sure people who work in the addiction and mood disorders area will know about. It's that lack of interest in previously pleasurable activities. And again, I'm not using this in a clinical way in regards to gaming addiction, but more in a general way. But anhedonia means that, that if you think about something like drugs or alcohol, we don't really care about anything else but the drugs or alcohol. Everything else doesn't seem to be very you know, good enough. And this is what can happen in a similar way when we talk about gaming. And because these gaming, these games are so beautifully designed that for some people, not everybody, but for some people, the things that would otherwise be rewarding, be they sport or be they social relationships, they aren't as rewarding anymore. And that system kind of changes to anything out, outside of anything else outside of this game isn't as rewarding. So I want to play more of this game. And we get stuck in this loop, um, which is why balance and the amount of time we spend on the screen is incredibly important. Um, because games, uh, they pack into effectively the very way our brain is built, which is we want experiences and we want novelty. Um, and again, nothing wrong with that. We just need to be aware of context. Um, I think I've covered that next slide pretty well already. Um, yeah. Uh, interesting study um, by Twenge and Campbell, um, two esteemed researchers, um, and they looked at uh, fourth. It's a big study, for, and this is last year. Forty thousand U.S. children, aged age between two and seventeen. Uh, it was a parental survey, so they can either post it out or uh, go online. Uh, and they classified high users uh, as seven hours per day and low users is about one hour per day or less. And there's a range of different levels that they could use. They also had moderate users of four hours per day and other users um, in between. What they found is after an hour a day, increasing screen time was generally linked to progressively lower psychological well-being. I think that's a really important finding. So after that first hour, time after that was related to progressively worsening well-being. 
Uh, and that screen time not necessarily related to homework, that's an important point to make. Um, so that's a separate issue altogether. You know, if screen time needs to be made for homework, then that's different again. One of the tricks I'm sure that the parents out there will, will know is that um, you know, they'll walk into the room uh, and the young person says, I'm doing my homework, but really they've got Fortnite up or got YouTube up or Instagram or whatever it might be. And you know, that's a really trick of battle to, um, to get through. Uh, and again, uh, the, uh, the 2018 study, uh, high users showed, less, so these are seven plus hours per day, high users showed less curiosity, self-control, and emotional stability. Uh, and twice as many high versus low users of screens had an anxiety or depressive disorder. Uh, and there was a significant increase in screen time use in that transition from primary school to high school. And that's an important discussion point to have because that's often the time when kids will get their first phone uh, in that transition. And very often it's because they're catching the bus to school and all those other things. Um, but that's the time where you really need to be having those conversations with a young person. Very, uh, very important point is that non-users, so people who didn't use screen time really at all, and low users, didn't differ in their well-being. I think that's an important point. Um, and it really highlights that idea that screen time's not bad. It's just a matter of how much you use it. If you use it for, you know, in this case, uh, around an hour a day, then it really had no worsening impact than anyone who didn't use it. And arguably it has some positive impacts too, of course. Um, and associations with well-being are larger for adolescents than for kids. Um, so cause and effect, do teenagers utilize screen time more because they're already anxious and depressed and disconnected? Um, so it's kind of a symptom of a, uh, an already existing problem or do screens directly impact on the mental health outcomes of teenagers? And again, I don't think there's a research study that has definitively answered that um, that I'm aware of. Um, but I think we, what we can say is that headlines like Facebook causes depression uh, or YouTube causes addiction. I think we need to be very skeptical with those kind of things um, because the cause and effect when it comes to these kind of things, mental health issues, uh, is a very rare thing. Um, there's always moderating, mediating variables. Um, so ultimately, technology is neither inherently good or bad, and it's all about context. Um, so let's just kind of talk a little bit about this idea of experiences and um, how technology can impact on the brain. So, uh, and looking at the way I've kind of structured this next part of the talk is we've looked at particularly um, different brain needs. In this case, one brain need is experience and one of the variables that technology brings that can impact or challenge that need. And in this case, it's the amount of time spent on the screen. Um, and again, that key point, it's not so much how much time you're on the screen, but what you're not doing when you're on the screen. So just think about this picture up for a tick. And this is a picture uh, around how the brain develops. And you can see what's happening in the newborn. We're born with lots and lots and lots and lots of brain cells. And as we have lots of experiences, we create these wonderful connections between our brain cells. And you can see the difference between a newborn and a one month old. These lovely little synaptic connections are already starting to occur. Our axons and our dendrites are starting to meet and connect with each other. At nine months, you can see these connections are getting even more developed. By the age of two, you can see that you've got a real forest in there, um, that there's so many different connections. Now what's interesting at the age of two is that you've got far too many connections. Our brain is incredibly efficient. Our brain doesn't want to use all those connections and our brain doesn't want to use the connections that it's not going to use again. And this is the use it or lose it principle. So in this case, the two-year-old says, well, there's lots and lots of connections here I'm never going to use, or the brain of the two-year-old says, there's lots of connections that I'm not going to use. So over the course of childhood and adolescence, we go through the process of pruning away those networks that we don't use. And that's the use it or lose it principle. Now, this is a good thing because our brain needs to actually go through this pruning principle in order to develop the networks that we really need. And if you look at the adult's brain, you can see there's less networks than the two-year-old's brain, but the networks are, if you like, thicker. Uh, and in this case, what that's a process called myelination. So what happens is we've got this fatty white coating called myelin, uh, and otherwise known as white matter. Uh, so that the, the gray matter is the cell body itself, and the white matter is the myelin that coats around it. The brain is super efficient, so the more coating we have around a pathway, the stronger that pathway will come or become, and the more likely we are to use that pathway. 
Now, when it comes to technology, if we're using technology lots, we're going to be coding a lot of the pathways responsible for helping us, like the hand-eye coordination we talked about before. Your hand-eye coordination is going to get a lot better. But if you're not using other experiences, we talked about tree climbing before, but it could be anything. It could be sport or music or anything else that might go by the wayside because of technology. Then those networks are getting pruned away, which has some significant impacts uh, on the way we develop as people. Now, I'm getting back to our tree climbing idea. So if we think about this idea of how much is too much. Well, the American Academy of Pediatrics in 2016 re released a recommendation that children under the age of 24 months shouldn't have any screen time at all, apart from video chats you know, with, um, with relatives you know, not in another country or whatever it might be. The truth is, though, that no one really knows how much screen time is healthy for young people or for adults as well. Uh, there's no definitive research that's done, probably because there are just so many different variables to consider here. But we get back to the Twenge and Campbell study. After an hour a day, increasing screen time was generally linked to progressively lower psychological well-being. Now, that doesn't mean that if you spend an hour and a half, then you know, that's going to be a terrible thing. But I think that's a pretty useful rule of thumb or a pretty useful just reference point for you then to think about what's healthy for you. Um, and time on screen, again, one of the things that I wanted to touch on here is sleep. Um, so uh, if, you, uh, if you've got a habit of being uh, at night in your bed looking at screen time uh, and what, looking at your phone or whatever it might be, um, that can disrupt melatonin release. Um, and again, I won't talk too much about this because it's probably another half an hour, but melatonin is a little chemical in our brain that signals it's time to go to sleep uh, and it's generally released at night time when it starts to get dark. Uh, the blue light emitted uh, can mimic daytime, if you like, which tricks our brain into thinking it's still light, which means it disturbs our melatonin release. And as a result of that, it's harder to get to sleep. And you get caught in this vicious cycle because when you can't sleep, you get on more screen time. And when you get on more screen time, it becomes even harder to sleep. And that has these flow-on effects to our mood, our concentration. If you think about, um, you know, if you're a 16-year-old trying to get there for year 11 tomorrow, but you haven't got to sleep till 3 o'clock, but you've got an 8.30 class in the morning, it's going to be pretty hard to focus on your on your algebra or your um, PE or your sport of your um, um, you know, your English or whatever that class might be. Um, so one of the key points here is that if you're using uh, your phone at night time, turn down the brightness. Uh, you turn down the brightness, it does help with that melatonin effect. Um, and try not to use your phone about an hour before you go to bed. It's a really good habit to get into. Uh, and keep screens out of bedrooms. So there's an interesting study by Gentile in 2017, uh, and she found, or they found, I should say, that um, screens in the bedroom, so when uh, there was a TV in the bedroom um, and a whole range of other possible screens, uh, it was associated with an increase in screen time, uh, a decrease in the amount that um, the young people read, decrease in the amount that they slept, and less interest in recreational activities. Uh, and the key variable there, I think, is ease of access. If you look at the addiction literature um, over the course of, um, of history, one of the key variables that's always identified in the addiction literature is ease of access. Uh, if you've got an alcohol problem and you move next to a bottle shop, then that's probably not going to go very well for your alcohol problem. Uh, if you've got a vulnerability to using too much screen time and you've got a screen in your bedroom, it's going to have the same effect. And one of the big impacts, as it's got here, is on sleep. Um, and uh, you know, just for those people uh, who might have young people who don't have screens in their bedroom, uh, I think one of the key points here is to try to hold out on that. Uh, if it's already in there, that's probably a discussion to have because getting that screen out can be, you know, can be challenging. Um, yeah, and the idea here is about shared screen. So you know, if you're going to um, get on a screen, try to make it a social experience, and we'll talk about that at the very end with our recommendations. Um, okay. Let's look at another brain need, which is social connection. In my opinion, it's just about the most important need for well-being that we have, and there's certainly a lot of research to back at that point. Um, and one of the technology variables that impacts on social connection is what we call passive consumption, um, which is basically when we're just scrolling through a news feed, for instance, scrolling through a Facebook feed, uh, and we passively consume information without actually interacting with anybody or any of the content. Um, an interesting... Um, piece of research from the Pew uh, Research Institute found that 77% of parents believed their teens were not present while on technology. Um, that kind of makes sense. But interestingly, 
41% of those teens believe their parents weren't present when they were on technology as well. So when the parent was on their own device, they felt that their parent wasn't present with them. Um, so one of the important things we need to think about as adults is we need to model good digital citizenship. We need to model useful and, and good habits there as well. Uh, and this is important because brain, in terms of brain development, social relationships are just not everything, but they're pretty close to everything. And uh, Sharon Begley, um, who's an eminent um, researcher in this area, uh, talked about this lovely quote, with modern parts atop old ones, the brain is like an iPod built around an eight track cassette player. So what does that mean? Well, if we think about the brain, the, uh, the brain develops effectively from the bottom up. So these structures here, uh, the green structure, which is called the hippocampus, the red structure, which is called the amygdala, that's the home of our fear response, our fight or flight response. That will tell us if we're safe or not safe. That part of the brain developed first because from an evolutionary perspective, survival means everything. The smart brain areas, which is that purple area you can see, which is the prefrontal cortex, that developed later, much, much later in terms of our human evolution. And uh, even today, what we what would argue and what we know is that that part of the brain doesn't fully develop until the age of 25, although theoretically um, it's still developing even well and truly after that. For a brain to be integrated, we need those emotional brain areas, those amygdala and what we call limbic system areas, to be connected to those smart brain areas. Uh, it's a process that Dan Siegel calls vertical integration. It's the idea that our emotional brain and smart brain are connected and talking towards each or talking together. Um, when they're disconnected, effectively that becomes a key vulnerability to mental health issues, uh, social disconnection and a whole range of other things. We want the smart logical part of our brain, the part of our brain that craves social relationships as well, talking with this more emotional part of our brain, telling us that the world is safe around us. Now thinking about this uh, in terms of the work of Alan Shaw, um, who talks about this concept of right to right connection. Um, again, the brain is very much a network. So um, the old idea of left and right brain is a myth that's been completely debunked. We know there's no such thing as someone who's left brain as someone who's right brain. The brain is very much a network. But what we do know uh, is that the right brain is very sensitive to social context. So the right brain, the right prefrontal cortex particularly, is very good at picking up uh, the intentions of others, body language of others, the tone of voice of others, and the facial expression of other people. So it's always attuned to what's happening with other people. Now, what's interesting about that uh, is that without seeing people face to face, without all that face to face interaction, that that part of the brain isn't as developed. So face to face interactions like a gym workout for our right part of our brain there. And that interaction, it starts with a mother and a child, you know, or a father and a child when we're born. That interaction, the smiling face um, and the playfulness, that starts a process um, of integration between our brain areas. Now, we start to miss out on that. That becomes problematic because a computer screen cannot give us that. It's impossible for a computer screen to give us that kind of thing. So things like body language, tone of voice, facial expressions, you might see that on a Skype call or something like that, but it's entirely different to what you get during the face-to-face -face interactions. And for the parents watching out there, we really need to prioritize those face-to-face -face interactions. Put your phone away, put them in a shared space in the house and sit down and talk. Sit down and talk to your partner or your friend or whoever that might be. Um, that stuff's really, really important in terms of the way our brain is wired because when we have that prefrontal cortex, that right brain activity happening, it starts to quieten down the emotional parts of our brain because ultimately it tells us that we're safe and we're connected uh, and connection is right at the heart of our well-being. And again, that's probably something I could talk for hours about, but we'll just skim through it. Um, interesting study uh, in 2014 uh, looked at this, this exact issue and took 51 um, preteens and they were taken on a five-day retreat uh, into, the, into the forest um, with, uh, you know, to a campsite uh, with no screen time at all. And it was a control group of 54 preteens who continued their normal media-rich lives. They came back and after five days of no technology, the group who went on the camp uh, with no technology were much better at picking up things like facial cues, um, facial expressions, nonverbal emotional cues. 
So that lack of technology actually then increased that prefrontal, that right prefrontal cortex. Uh, theoretically, they didn't measure brain activity, but theoretically, um, I dare say it would have been activating that part of the brain. Uh, that doesn't mean you have to have five days of media free time or technology free time. Um, but one of the key recommendations I'll always make is have at least one day a week where you're free from screen time, whether that's a Saturday or a Sunday or you know during your work day if you don't have to work on the screen time. Uh, really important one. Another one on Facebook, um, and again, context matters. This is an interesting study um, looking at social comparisons. And we think about um, social media, there's a lot of social comparisons that happen. Um, there was an average, they, they looked at um, uh, these um, college students, 736, and there was an average of two hours on Facebook uh, every day. And they gave them an envy scale, a scale of envy, uh, how much they envy other people, and also a depression scale. And what we know about social comparisons is we can make either upward social comparisons or downward social comparisons. So upward social comparison would be, I think this person on my Instagram feed is better than me. So I'm comparing myself and looking at them being up or better than me. We can also look, make downward social comparisons where we say, I feel like I'm better, my life is better than the people under me. Okay, well, I think they're under me, I should say. Um, so one you would think would make you feel bad, which is the upward social comparison. You feel worse by looking at the other people. You also theoretically possibly think that looking at people and thinking you're better than them would make you feel better. It doesn't turn out to be the case at all. In this particular study, um, making social connections of any direction, be it up or down, was correlated with more depressive symptoms. So in this case, if you're using your social media as a way to compare yourself to others, um, then that becomes really problematic. Um, yeah, so, and this is what um, Edson talks about. Um, if we use social media as a surveillance device, that becomes pretty problematic. Okay, um, okay. let's think about a little kind of takeaway idea we can think about here. Um, so one idea we talk about, we talked about novelty before um, and why novelty is important. Our brain absolutely craves novelty and really loves novelty. Um, this is somebody that I worked with um, quite some time ago um, and it was very hard to get this person off um, a screen. Um, you know, this particular person I'm talking about is really a conglomerate of different ideas, so to protect anyone's confidentiality here. Um, and uh, there was a real issue with getting this person out of the house, um, and that was hugely problematic. And this person was making predictions, uh, for example, um, nothing out of the house is going to be interesting to me. Um, nothing that exists outside of my screen could be better than what's inside of my screen. I can get all the needs that I want on my screen, um, whether it be Fortnite, YouTube, or whatever it might actually be. Um, so we set up a little experiment, um, and we really, I call this the novelty lucky dip. Uh, and this is the idea that we need to go out and give our brain lots of different experiences that it has never had before, or that it used to have, but it hasn't had, it, uh, had for a long time. And what we asked this person to do is put a whole range of different experiences, it was a family activity, put a whole range of different experiences, um, and each person in the family writes down something that they um, would like to do that they haven't done before. So there's four people in the family, uh, you know, you write down four or five things, and each person puts that in uh, an envelope, or you can put it in a bucket, or whatever works. Uh, and then each week or each fortnight, depending on how much time you have, you pull that out of the bucket and you say, this is what I'm gonna do. You can do this by yourself as well, by the way. You don't have to do this as a family. You can have this as an individual uh, experiment. And you pull that out and you go and do it. And one of the activities um, that this particular, uh, this group of people did was they went on a, um, on a, a river um, paddle. So they went and hired some canoes and went on a paddle down the river. Um, and this was obviously a multi-sensory experience, a very different experience um, to the one on the screen. And I asked the question, well, how was it? Uh, and this particular person had a problematic relationship with the people in, in, um, in their family. Um, and uh, I asked her, how was it? He said, well, I still don't really love the people in my family. I still don't really um, you know, feel like I get along with them that well, but I'd actually be okay to do that again with my family. I'd actually be okay to go out and repeat that experience. 
And it's that shared experience that starts a seed of growth uh, and it stimulates the very thing that our brain wants, which is social connection and novelty. Um, yeah, so that's a little takeaway that you guys can think about um, going away and working on. Yeah. Okay. So I think that's pretty much it. Um, there's a lot, uh, a lot more that we could possibly cover here. Uh, this is really a, a full day's workshop uh, that we're trying to cover in less than an hour. Um, so I think we're going to um, have some questions now that we might be able to ask. Okay. Oh, that was amazing, Dave. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you, Helen. Yeah, really interesting. Um, and I took an awful lot from that as a parent and as a clinician. And I guess thinking through some of the concepts that you were talking about, um, I guess a couple of the things that you left me with. One is um, a memory of running through the rain of Manchester and that sensory experience again of kind of the, the gritty rain of Manchester. Um, so yeah, that was really, that was a, a memory that kind of was really, I was really reflecting on as you were talking. So good, yeah. Um, and I think some of the other things that you kind of made me think about were kind of around working as a clinician and, and as a parent of preteens, that kind of distinction between social media use and real life. And mm. I know some of the work that we've been doing recently with our youth partners has been around that separation. And for me, those two things are quite separate, but for young people, less so. And I guess that goes with, again, some of the messages you had. Um, and I guess I guess the kind of the thing also that I was considering as we were taught as you were talking was um how to maybe um how as a parent or as a clinician we can kind of have some of those conversations around how to how those things are integrated but how we can work with young people to kind of understand some of those concepts around um uh, all, all the all the points that you were making i just wondered if you had any thoughts about yeah, that yeah absolutely i think one of the, the really simple things that we often don't think about uh as, as parents or you know even if you're a clinician working with a family uh, is if you've got a young person who loves gaming grab a console and start playing with them uh, and the research, there's some research on this actually that will say that uh, the closeness of your relationship with your young person will actually grow if you share that experience with them. Remember the brain what needs experiences to grow. Online experiences are absolutely experiences. And when you mm -hmm. mesh that with a social connection, um, that's really powerful. And also one of the other things that it does, um, which really gets to another key brain need for young people, which is the need to have them as the expert. Uh, oh, brain from, they really yeah. they really enjoy feeling like they can tell you something. Uh, and as we know through years of research, um, you know, in the education system, uh, is that the best way to learn something is to teach something. Absolutely. Uh, you can kind of show them, hey, I don't know much about this. Can you tell me how to do it? Uh, they'll probably laugh at you and you'll probably be terrible at it. Uh, but I dare say they'll respect you and really enjoy that experience. So, you know, if you're there, you know, doing whatever you do, if you're on your laptop doing work or, you know, chopping the carrots for dinner or whatever it might be, uh, I know it's very difficult to you know, make these times, but it's a really valuable time to get down and, uh, and, and share that in, uh, online experience with them, uh, particularly with games in that way. Yeah, that's really interesting, actually, because I think going in as a as a parent or as a clinician, I have pretended to be interested in things that I've really had no experience of at all. And I think that going in as the as them being the expert in that relationship could be really powerful as an Definitely. intervention and as a as a as developing some of those family traditions. Absolutely, and again, it's 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 parenting with a brain in mind, or teaching with a brain in mind, or uh, you know, being a clinician with a brain in mind, and it gives us all those things: social connection and giving that young person a sense of progress and mastery over what they do. Again, those are all really important uh, in terms of developing um, a healthy and integrated brain. Well, that's amazing. Thank you very much, yeah. Dave. Thank you. That's a really interesting talk, and I hope you've all found it really interesting. Um, do keep your eye on the website for um, other webinars in the area um, and other resources. And um, we hope to see you again very soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Helen. Thanks for having me.